So this is marginal zone lymphoma. And just by background, marginal zone lymphoma comprises a group of indolent lymphomas originating from memory B lymphocytes present in the marginal zone of secondary uh, lymphoid follicles. Their treatment for marginal zone lymphoma varies by subtype. Patients with marginal zone lymphoma generally receive rituximab alone or in combination with chemotherapy. This is usually more for the nodular marginal zones. And treatment options, especially for nodular marginal zone lymphoma, are based on guidelines for follicular lymphoma. There are really no studies that really take on a marginal zone lymphoma until very recently, and they're always part of a larger trial for indolent lymphoma where follicular lymphoma gets most of the emphasis. So in essence, marginal zone lymphoma is the stepchild uh, to sibling follicular uh, lymphoma. And part of this is understandable. A follicular lymphoma comprises about 22% of new NHL cases as of 2005. There's really not too much change in the more recent data. And marginal zone comprises only really 8%, and the overwhelming majority of those are actually, in fact, malt lymphomas. So we have really three distinct entities. We have extranodal malt, which comprises 90% of the marginal zones. 50% of those are gastric, but you can have intestinal malt, ocular, anexi malt, lung malt, skin malt, thyroid malt after thyroiditis. So nodular uh, marginal zone only comprises 6% of this very small group to begin with, and splenic lymphoma only 4%. This is just a, a, an illustration of, uh, of malt lymphoma of the eye. I don't know if you folks have uh, ever seen a case, but uh, we've seen a few cases that come to me usually from Philadelphia uh, from the Wilms Clinic. And it's the upper, let me see if I can get this. If you can see it, it comes off the lacrimal gland. It can also involve the conjunctiva. So one of the interesting things about malt lymphoma is that they're often associated with either infection or inflammation. Uh, H. pylori, we're all familiar with the story as far as stomach malts are concerned. Uh, Campylobacter has been associated with intestinal malts, and some of these intestinal malts will end up making heavy chain disease, where you don't have the full molecule, but maybe the FC fragments. And as chlamydia cetaci has been associated with I and Nexi, we've actually done a fair number of studies on that. And the people from Italy contend that indeed uh, chlamydia creates a problem uh, for, uh, from I malts. This is uh, the Nexi. We tried demonstrating chlamydia uh, satachi. We've done several different studies, and we haven't been able to demonstrate it. But what is true is that if you give doxycycline, like you do for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, other illnesses, uh, such as Lyme disease, and you give it, we found four weeks is probably more important than three, uh, it's probably more effective than three weeks, that in many instances, the, the, uh, the malt of the eye and nexi will actually go away. Now, they've recently reported Acrobacter in lung malts, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi in skin. Now, that was reported from England, and we've actually had some of these malt lymphomas of the skin. They sometimes call them salt. We've given lots of doxycycline for these, but we never seem to have any response. However, in the case of hepatitis C, which, uh, which is associated more with the splenic splenic marginal zones with the leukemic phase, what we find is that actually treating the hep C does, in fact, uh, make it go away. So anybody that comes into you with, with splenic marginal zone lymphoma, it's absolutely imperative that you check for hepatitis C. And we've treated several of these patients for hepatitis C and have seen all the sequelae of the disease go away. Well, just to show you, to demonstrate where this uh, disease uh, occurs, it occurs mostly right here in this memory B cell that's outside of the mantle cell, more in the periphery, as we had mentioned uh, earlier on. So there's some very characteristic immunophenotypes of malt lymphomas. They're obviously CD20 positive since they're B cell lymphomas as well as CD79A for the same reason. Uh, but some of the negative studies are very important. Uh, they're CD5 negative and CD10 negative. They're CD25 negative and CD103 uh, negative. The CD25 and 103 excludes Harry cell, which can often be confused, especially when you have a big spleen. Uh, 5 excludes uh, CLL and mantle cell, and 10 excludes follicular lymphoma. 
Now, your pathologist will generally not say it's diagnostic of marginal zone lymphoma. They'll usually report that it is uh, consistent with, because we have no one specific test that says it's marginal zone lymphoma. In contrast to follicular, where you're always CD10 positive, or CLL, where you're 5 and 23 positive, you don't have that here. Now, when I get uh, malt lymphomas of the stomach, we're always tempted, if it's a superficial malt of the stomach, to give antibiotics. However, I always insist that they do fish studies because I'm particularly interested in translocation 1118, uh, which, which codes for translocation of the malt 1 gene. And if the malt 1 gene is present, you can forget giving antibiotics because you simply won't get better. Well, I was looking all over the literature to try to find enough patients to really look at survival studies uh, on marginal zone lymphoma. And the only one I could find was from the French. This is from Dr. Coiffier and Dr. Berger, and looking for survival on these patients. If you look here, you'll see that the median survival runs out to around seven and a half years for all comers. Uh, as you, if you can look out here. It rubs out beyond seven and a half years. So most of these patients do live a fairly uh, good life, a long life at least, but time to progression, of course, is far much shorter. And this is time to progression. This is a funny, really a very confusing slide, and I apologize, but as I was able to tease it out, the bottom line on this is that the time to progression is particularly uh, bad, at least worse for those patients with, with nodular uh, lymphoma disseminated uh, uh, malts also don't do particularly well in terms of time to progression. But when you look at, at the overall survival, again, you'll see that, that actually it's nodular and splenic lymphomas that seem to do the poorest. But yet, if you're looking where the median survival is, it is at still for a, a pretty good distance. So the medians run about seven years, seven and a half years. And uh, the, it's the splenics and the nodulars that do the poorest. And we, when you look at the five-year survival by the end of these, using the SEER database, uh, you find that uh, at five years, the malts do best because many of them sometimes are limited and they tend to be indolent. Splenic marginal zone is 76%. That's coming up now with the effective therapy that we have for, uh, for hepatitis C. And nodular marginal zone comes in at 77%. So what are some of the customary treatments? Well, if you have, for instance, a skin uh, lymphoma, you really don't really need to treat it. If you want to give some spot radiation, it's fine. But they really rarely, if ever, go beyond the skin. You can observe them. And even if you have nodular marginal zone, if it's indolent, as mentioned, with follicular, you can observe. There have been instances of where splenectomy has been used primarily um, in the leukemic, the, the splenic marginal zone lymphomas. However, we're looking at, looking through our records now, we have a sense that when you take out the spleen and marginal zone lymphoma, there's a greater tendency to, uh, to transformation. Radiation for local malt worked very, very effectively. The overall response uh, rate is 90 per, plus, more than 90 percent, probably closer to 95 percent. And the disease-free uh, uh, interval is probably at five years is probably closer to 90 percent than 75 percent. So my choice of treatment, although there are various options given for malts of the stomach, you can use local radiation, you can use rituxan, you could use chemotherapy. They have all been reported. But if you really want to take a curative approach, which is locally uh, directed, uh, for my money, I use uh, radiation. It's very important, though, to get someone who does a lot of radiation for the stomach because it can be very tricky. Now, uh, for the others, rituximab or uh, any other anti-CD20 antibody is used uh, very much, uh, very often. And, but most of the time, when you're using chemotherapy, it's almost always used uh, with rituxan. Now, they looked at the resort trial, looked at rituxan, and they had 71 untreated patients. And the overall response rate was 52%. However, the time to treatment failure with maintenance was 4.8 uh, years versus uh, one year. Whether we should take that as gospel, I don't know, but at least that's the, that's the results that they gave. And of course, as I said, when you're using it with chemotherapy, when you use chemotherapy, it's almost invariably used with rituxan. So I went back to look at the Rummel study, which is a source of great contention with our debaters. And we, we pulled out uh, the, uh, the marginal zone lymphomas, and according to him, Progression-free survival for uh, bendamustine uh, plus rituximab was 57 months 
versus CHOP plus rituximab, which is only 47 months. Now again, I have my problems with the Rommel study, I think, as Andy had mentioned earlier. People have used other combinations. Some people have used chlorambucil and chlorambucil with rituxan, but it's not used very often. We many years ago reported on what we called TOPM, and I would, we actually got a 95% response rate and a 75% CR rate. The reason I don't tell you more about it is it's extremely hard to get a hold of thiotepper and mitoxantrum. This is thiotepper to replace cytoxin in a CHOP regimen, mitoxantrum to replace adriamycin, oncovin, and prednisone. Well, it's certainly less toxic in terms of cardiac toxicity. It does have some uh, marrow toxicity, some increased marrow toxicity. And where, what we now have recently heard about are novel agents in the treatment of marginal lymphoma, particularly in brutinib, uh, in brutinib and lenalidomide. <clears throat> so the first-line treatment for bendamustine, this is, oh, this is a study that I want to show you of chemotherapy using bendamustine rituxan for extranodal marginal zone lymphoma. And what they showed in this particular study uh, by Dr. Solar and others was that all you needed was four cycles. And I would adduce that this particular curve here is very, very impressive indeed. So using bendamustine rituxan, is, it seems to be a pretty good approach. And you don't need to use a whole lot of uh, treatment for a marginal zone lymphoma. So let's talk about novel therapy one, and that's targeting Bruton's tyrosine kinase with the brutinib in relapsed refractory marginal zone lymphoma. And this is a publication by Ariel Noy from, uh, from Memorial Hospital. We participated in this study. And what, uh, the treatment schema was as, was as follows. We gave him Bruvaco, we gave four capsules. That is 140 milligrams as one daily dose. And we modified for toxicity. You could drop back to three capsules or two capsules as needed. And I'm sure all of you from having been here at the conference know full well that, uh, what the complications are of atrial, of uh, Imbruvica, particularly atrial fibrillation, hypertension, bleeding, and the such. Well, this curve here looks at the various uh, uh, differences in, uh, in terms of how Imbruvica would work against various uh, prognostic factors. When I looked at this uh, particular uh, slide, I was impressed that there really isn't a whole lot of difference in almost all of these groups, whether it be subtype, age, and so forth. But what I was really impressed with was the fact that that tumor size really didn't matter very much. And in fact, large tumors responded very rapidly uh, to this treatment, which I think is rather typical. You know, you get the, the, the when you treat with Imbruvica and the singling inhibitors, what happens is the tumors tend to shrink a lot faster than anything else. And that's certainly, uh, certainly faster in CLL than the Y count. So I was very impressed that the tumor size did not really impact uh, the ability of this treatment uh, to uh, produce a response. So in, in summary, 63 patients were enrolled with marginal zone. The median age was 66. Bone marrow involvement was about a third. Median number of prior therapies was two with a range from one to nine. All had prior exposure to an anti-CD20 antibody. 22% were refractory to last therapy. Cytopenias comprised 43% and B symptoms 24%. And here are the results. The overall response rate was 48%. Complete remissions were 3%. But it's very typical of singling inhibitors. We rarely get complete remissions. It doesn't seem to be quite as necessary. The median duration was 11.6 months. And in people being exposed for greater than 12 months to the therapy comprised 48%. With the median follow-up at 19 months, 38% continued on a brutinib. But there again, a fair number of people came off study. And here is the response to brutinib as, uh, as shown up on the upper left-hand corner is by the independent uh, assessment and on the right-hand uh, right side is the investigator assessment. And as you can see, the overall response rate uh, falls in pretty much around 48 to 50 percent. And here's the waterfall plot. It was clear that this, uh, that this uh, medicine, in fact, does impact most of the marginal zone lymphomas. Here is some of the uh, other statistics on this, and uh, what I'd like to call your attention to uh, is the uh, overall survival down here. And as you can see, the patients seem to be faring fairly well uh, uh, having received this treatment. But I think it's important to point out that this tends to be an indolent disease, so it may not, this nice curve here may not all be totally attributable to the medication. 
So now let's go on to novel therapy two. This is lenalidomide plus rituximab in relapse refractory marginal zone lymphoma. And this is abstract 139 that was presented at Lugano, which consists of lenalidomide plus rituxan in patients with relapse refractory marginal zone lymphoma. And this is a subset analysis. It's always a subset analysis. They never go out to look at it per se uh, for marginal zone lymphoma. It's always a spinoff from large cell, I mean from uh, follicular lymphoma. And this is called the magnified trial. They also sometimes refer to it as R-squared. And the rationale for this is that lenalidomide in combination with rituxan, uh, R-squared, is active and well-tolerated in first line and re relapse and refractory uh, marginal zone lymphoma that had been shown earlier. And the magnified was a phase three randomized open label multi-center study of R-squared induction therapy followed by R-squared maintenance versus rituxan. So with the randomization here is whether you should continue maintenance uh, with the lenalidomide or just use rituxan alone. Um, and uh, the, we're going to be talking, of course, specifically about marginal zone lymphoma. And this is the, uh, the study design, which we just mentioned to you before. Again, everybody gets lenalidomide at 20 milligrams. You, usually in myeloma, you're starting off with 25 with rituximab, and then you, you go ahead and get treated. You get stratified between lenalidomide and rituxan versus rituxan alone, and then you have this optional uh, uh, choice of continuing with lenalidomide after the, stop, after the study has been completed. And, uh, and this is the number of patients with the marginal zone. There were 18 with nodular marginal zone, 10 with splenic marginal zone, and 10 with malt lymph uh, marginal zone. And here are the baseline uh, characteristics. Uh, I'd like to point out to you that uh, about uh, over half had just had uh, one uh, course of therapy prior to instituting R squared. And the most common prior treatments, Andy and, and, um, uh, and Jonathan, please take note. Uh, rituxan was 50%, BR was 26 and RCHOP was, was 18. And here are the best uh, responses for each one of them. Again, the responses, or overall response was 57% for nodular. Oops, let me go back. 63% uh, for splenic, and uh, I think that's 80% for malt lymphomas. So, but the, the problem is, again, you, one must take into account that these numbers are very, very small. Uh, again, we have gotten complete remissions, roughly at a 50% level. This is sort of an outlier, and 40% with malt. But nevertheless, this, this treatment seems to be quite effective in the treatment of uh, malt lymphomas in marginal zones. This is the duration of response. As you can see with splenic uh, marginal zone and, and malts, we do better as we have done in the past. Here's the duration of response, which is really quite good uh, for splenic and malts. Nodules, again, don't do quite as well, but you're looking out here. We're very early on. If I showed you earlier, the, the survival rates are really quite high. And, and, uh, Aggression-free survivals tend to be long as well. And again, we're early on into the study. And here are some of the grade three and four uh, treatment-related AEs, uh, adverse events. There, there really is, a, in general, it's a fairly well-tolerated uh, regimen. And again, you see the same sort of toxicities that you normally see uh, with uh, Revlimid and Rituxan. You do get some hematologic uh, toxicity, uh, but not all that much. So in conclusion, R-squared therapy shows favorable activity and a tolerable safety profile in advanced stage re relapse and refractory marginal zone. as a 66% overall response rate, 44% CR rate uh, in evaluable marginal zone patients. The observed safety profile is consistent with prior analysis and enrollment is ongoing, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>